This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Storytelling dates back to the beginning of time. In fact, stories are perhaps the strongest bonds we have with other nations and races. Australian Aborigines painted symbols from stories on cave walls to help storytellers remember their tales. The Egyptians were the first people to write down their stories, and the Romans, through their travels and conquests, were adept at disseminating stories. The purpose of storytelling is to share stories that unite us. Regardless of our culture, stories bring us together and bridge the gaps among us. They're also tools for learning and exchanging ideas. But not all storytellers are created equal. Surely you've noticed that some people are wonderful storytellers and others just make you yawn. The idea of storytelling is to relate events in words, images, sounds, and embellishments. It is a way to convey the emotional power of information. Author and professor Robert McKee in his book Story says, Stories are equipment for living. In fact, when a new story is told well, the listener is transported on a journey to a new place, writes Diana Rabb. In this episode, Valeria Tellez interviews her, Diana Rabb. She is the author of Writing for Bliss, a seven-step plan for telling your story and transforming your life. Diana Rabb, MFA, PhD, is a memoirist, poet, blogger, speaker, and award-winning author of nine books. Her work has been published and anthologized in over 1,000 publications. She frequently speaks on writing for healing and transformation. She's been writing since the age of 10, when her mother gave her a Khalil Gibran journal to help her cope with her grandmother's suicide. At that early age, she realized that writing made her feel better and helped her heal from life's challenges. She says that she's spiritual, but not religious. She views writing as her spiritual practice, and she writes every day. Rab blogs for Psychology Today, Psych Central, and Thrive Global, and is a guest blogger for many others. She's editor of two anthologies, Writers and Their Notebooks, and Writers on the Edge. Two memoirs, Regina's Closet, Finding My Grandmother's Secret Journal, and Healing with Words, A Writer's Cancer Journey, and four poetry collections, including Lust. Her latest books are Writing for Bliss, a seven-step program for telling your story and transforming your life, and Writing for Bliss, a companion book. Meet Diana at dianarab.com. Here's the interview with Diana Rabb. In your own words, who is Diana Robb? Oh, boy, that's a loaded question. I am uh, <laughs> a, a 68-year-old woman who is a writer, author, poet, and I also inspire other people to write their stories. And I'm a teacher. I'm a mother of three, grandmother of five, and I live in California. That sounds wonderful, especially the part of teaching others how to write story. And the question that comes to mind is one that I have here for later on. I'll ask you now, how did you become interested in storytelling and writing? Well, I started writing when I was 10 years old. My grandmother was my caretaker and uh, she had passed away in my house and I had found her and there was a lot of 
chaos and trauma at the time. And my mother and was an English major and she gave me a journal and she told me, write your feelings. And so that's kind of, you know, that was the springboard for my life as a, as a writer and writing when I, you know, was hurting or feeling good. It was sort of where I turned to during difficult times. That's wonderful. And I did read that in the book. It's one of the sections I have here to talk about, but since you already did. Talk to me a bit more about feelings and emotions, Diana. Why is that important to write them? Well, it's important to write feelings and emotions because that's the only way to get down to the truth of what's going on in your heart and in your head. And so if you're writing, you know, it's the only way to also to tap into your inner voice. And if you're telling a story, you want the person who's reading your story to feel what you're feeling. And if you just say, I feel happy, that's really not enough. What does happy mean? Where do you feel in your body? That's what the reader wants to hear. Where do you feel in your body? That's an interesting idea. What is the connection between feelings, emotions, and body sensations? Is there a difference between feelings and emotions? No, they're pretty interconnected. You know, emotions, we often think of emotions as more dramatic, more, you know, if you will, stronger. Mm -hmm. But they're pretty similar. They're intertwined. How have you learned to connect emotions and feelings with body sensations? Is that something that is a training tool or some sort of um, course? Or how do we learn to do that? Or how did you learn to do that? Well, I think it's just all about self-awareness, being connected. You talked about interconnectedness in our talk before we um, went on air. And so we're, you know, we're connected with the universe, but we're also connected to our bodies in the sense that anything going on in our head will have a manifestation in our body. You know, it's all it's all connected. And in terms of learning about it, it's just about being self-aware and paying attention is that being aware, becoming aware, is the first step being open? That's what I wonder sometimes. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, open to other people's feelings, open to your own feelings for sure. But it's all, it's all, openness is all con connected to being available to hear your inner voice, being able to feel the feelings, being able to articulate what you're feeling. Sometimes you're having a feeling and walk into a room and you have this feeling like I don't belong here. There's, there's danger. So can you, you know, the chicken storytelling is the challenge is can you articulate to your reader what that feeling is you're feeling? Is your heart beating fast? Is it that you're sweating? Is it that you just want to run? Is it that, that you're afraid of something in particular? So it's getting down to the specific details of your feeling that will resonate with the reader. When it comes to the time to express feelings truthfully and be true to ourselves, another wonderment of mine, what is the balance between that and being kind to others so we don't hurt them? Well, it's being also, it's being mindful of the other person. I mean, there are certain people you can be straightforward with and say, you know, I don't like the way you look today. And other people you would say, you know, maybe you want to put on another pair of shoes. So you have to know who your audience is. You know, we're not cookie cutter people. We all have feelings and re reactions that are all different. So you have to know your audience. And when you're, especially if you're having, you know, a disagreement, mm -hmm. you have to take versus feelings and way of being into consideration. Talk to me for a moment about the connection between storytelling and spirituality. Well, you know, storytelling dates back to the beginning of time. I mean, storytelling connects us, stories unite us, and anything that unites us, you know, clearly is going to be spiritual, right? So we hear stories, we're transported. We could be transported to other universes. We could be transported to other continents, other countries, other cities. And so, like, for example, in Hawaii, the art of storytelling is, ka is called ka'u, and elders in Hawaii look at um, life as sim symbolic metaphors through, and they learn how to be in the world through storytelling. 
And so that's all very spiritual, you know. And when you're telling a story, the mood is very important. That kind of connects the listener to uh, what, what, what story that you're telling. That is um, another fascinating topic when it comes to storytelling and wisdom, because the way where you're coming from, what are you saying? It's clearly coming from storytelling based on union and wisdom. But we see that storytelling has been used also to separate human beings. So yeah, I would love to hear from you a little bit about that, if you can, of course, if you want to make a comment about tribalism and storytelling as a tool of separation. Yeah, I mean, I don't really talk about tribalism in my book per se. I mean, I mainly focus on, you know, choosing the right time and audience when you're telling a story, taking into consideration the level, um, the, the educational level, the uh, age level of your audience. You know, you wouldn't tell a child when you're talking about death exactly what happens you know, in the process of what what they do to the body before they bury them. I mean, there's you have to take all these things into consideration. And when you're telling a story, there's, you know, like when you're reading a novel, there's a beginning, middle, and end. And a good story will have that, a beginning, middle, and end. It'll keep the reader's interest, you know, have some suspense. Something has to happen in a story. You can't have, you know, stick figures kind of standing there on the screen. Something has to be created. The characters have to change from the beginning to the end. And yeah, that's one of the tips you have. Actually, you give them tips for storytellers. That is under the uh, blog post, The Magic and Passion of Storytelling. Mm-hmm. You just uh, described some of that. Actually, there's one that I really like. When I was writing my own book about my own story, I remember kind of becoming very aware of where I was coming from kind of talking about my mother, had been abused. But then I was really careful not creating this uh, space for victimhood and then letting other people kind of read that story and then becoming upset and even angry towards my mother. So as a memorist, talk to me for a moment about how can we kind of tell our stories in a way that doesn't communicate this message again, of hatred, of separation? Well, you know, this is all, what everything you're saying is actually counterintuitive to creativity. I mean, you cannot sit down and write your true story and think in the back of your head, should I say this, should I not? Because as soon as you have that editor, you know, alive, (laughs) you're not going to get the words out in a way that are compelling and you're going to hold back. And so that's very counterintuitive to the creative process. So What I tell my students is just like, write it. And then if you're thinking of publishing it, I mean, a lot of people write their story just for healing. They don't necessarily have to publish it. Um, But write your story. If you're going to publish it, then, you know, your editor, you could talk to your editor about it. You know, I always also, you know, about cutting out parts that might hurt others. The parts of the universe are ugly. Parts are beautiful. You can't have fear. You can't live in fear when you... You know, when you're writing, it's just not good for the creative process. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Diana. That's interesting to hear. <laughs> yeah, I wrote my memoir and my mother was, you know, she was a narcissist and I I had to write my emotional truth. I'm not writing her story. I'm writing my story and how she influenced me and, you know, it might help other people going through similar, you know, childhoods. So But no, you can't be thinking about what you're writing when you're writing. You just have to let it rip, just write. I love that advice. Yes, (laughs) a billion times (laughs) to that. And I love the way you said that too, that life itself, the universe, it's always, um, it's good and bad. It has both, the opposites. It's not just one thing. Right. So true. So let me ask you, I know we talked before about your book, Writing for Bliss, Seven Step Plan, for telling your story and transforming your life. So what was the main intention of writing your book when you did? Uh, The main intention was that I was teaching a lot of writing workshops and my students said that they were sorry that the workshops ended and they asked me to write a book that they could take with them and continue to work on their writing journey. And so that was my inspiration, my students. 
There's something else that caught my attention under that blog post that you wrote, The Magic and Passion of Storytelling, where you say that you had a personal kauma or shaman in Hawaii while you're there. And then you said that she reminds me to remain in the moment. Remaining in the moment and being mindful also leads to happiness. I would love to hear more about that because I do believe in that too. And I wonder why we tend to not be in the moment to try to escape it. Well, it's, you know, it's easy. It's not, it, <laughs> uh-huh, it's easy not to be in the moment. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's easy. <laughs> so uh, true. I mean, when you're writing and because I'm a writer and, you know, my, my understanding is this talk is going to be about writing and storytelling. Uh, and, and when I'm writing and when people are writing that you need to be in the moment, you could be writing about the past and you could be writing about the future, but you've got to be in the moment with your pen and your paper or your computer. You can't be, you know, walking around the garden and thinking about what you're going to plant tomorrow. I mean, you, you've got to remain in the moment to, uh, and focus on the beauty of the moment rather than thinking of the regrets of the past or the, you know, what what ifs of the future. Uh, I think happiness and mindfulness uh, is very, they're, they're intertwined. People that are happy tend to be more mindful. Mm. Oh, wow. That's the first time I hear that way. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Happiness and mindfulness, uh, they are connected. Um, that is interesting to hear. <laughs> and um, one of the tips that you gave under that blog post for storytellers, you said, the one that caught my attention said, engage readers and listeners on an emotional level by sharing universal emotions that resonate with them. Right. So I was like wondering about the universal emotions. What are some examples of that, Diana? Well, universal emotions are, you know, love, hate, grace, um, passion, those kind of things, you know, and rather than just using the words, you might want to just describe specifically what you're feeling. And again, getting in touch with your body sensations and what's running through your mind. Let's say that you're writing about a love scene, Uh, you know, you're, you're, beautifully describing it, but what emotions are running through your body at that time? You know, that's, that's what readers, that's how readers connect with your story through the emotions. You want to make the reader feel that they are walking with you on your journey. And I have an open question about passion and purpose. Do you see them as being the same thing? Well, you know, sometimes... (laughs) Sometimes they're connected. You know, I like to tell people that, you know, love what you do and do what you love, you know, because that will lead to happiness. So, um, I mean, we all have life themes, like I mentioned in my book, Writing for Bliss, and those themes will drive you, whether it's You know, you want to raise a family and be, you know, the family matriarch, whether it's you want to be a writer, whether you want to be an interviewer, maybe if you want to be a spiritual guru, you know, that's where your heart feels the best. That's where you feel your heart sing, if you will. So to me, passion and your life theme uh, and purpose are all interconnected. I think we've all been brought here for a purpose. Is that a spiritual belief, Diana? Or just Yes, it is. I do think that we're all and the sad part is some people take a very long time, although they eventually do figure out what that purpose is. And they know their purpose when they feel really good doing what they're doing. That's the sign, right? Yeah, Yeah, that's the sign. Um, Another question I have, you mentioned earlier when we talked for a moment about the connection between storytelling and healing and how healing it is to write, even if you don't plan to publish. Is that something that's backed by science these days? Yeah, sure. There's a lot of stories. I mean, James Pennebaker was one of the first Um, One of the first psychologists that did studies on that back in the 70s. And, you know, he said if people, I think he used some college students and um, with journaling and if they wrote 15 minutes a day, you know, he monitored their heart rate and their various body functions and said that, you know, there was definitely a correlation between the release of the words on the page and, and health. 
you mentioned under a different blog post that's titled Writing in Storytelling for Healing, you say the power of storytelling is particularly obvious in programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous, where people come together to share their experiences. So that I didn't know. I heard that the Alcoholics Anonymous, they are also very spiritual. There is a spiritual component there. And the storytelling is part of that too, right, Diana? I didn't know about that part. Right. Yeah. You know, in the discussion of storytelling, you can see how that's powerful, how if you're hearing my story and I'm hearing your story, you know, it makes you feel like you're not alone. It makes you feel like there's, it gives you hope. So, of course, during those situations, it's extremely helpful. So in your book, uh, Writing for Bliss, under step four, examining your life purposes and themes, as you just mentioned, you also have uh, writing the big questions. That caught my attention, too, because they're powerful questions. You ask, what really matters to you? One question. Then what is your soul's purpose? What is life for? To what do you want to Consecrate? What's consecrate your life? What do you want to devote your life to? It's sacred, right? It's related to sacredness. Right. Devotion, yeah. Kind of caught my attention. I stopped for a moment and I was contemplating these questions. What is sacred to me? What really matters? And the more I think about it, the more I have been living these things, I see how much trust and courage it takes to really be true to yourself. Is that something that you also teach, Diana, your students when going through the writing process to be courageous and to trust? Of course. You have to be very, very courageous to be a writer, especially a nonfiction writer if you're writing about your life. Um, And then to trust the process. You know, sometimes people are in a big rush to get their work published. And I said, you know, Writing is like a journey. You have to enjoy the journey and not always think of the destination. So, And yes, courage is a huge part of it because especially when you're writing your emotional truth about difficult experiences that you've had, uh, it's sometimes not very easy. But, you know, usually the rewards are huge and students find that out pretty quickly. This question, what is life for? This is an interesting question that I never asked and I never thought about it. What is life for? What comes to mind, Diana? How do you answer this question, <laughs> if you don't mind? Yeah, well, I actually had to do it for a, there was a, there's a site called the Excellence Reporter. You might be interested in it. Uh, and I was asked to write, I was asked to answer that question on that site. And so for me, a lot emerged. I mean, to me, I felt that love was at the core of everything, you know. That's what life is for. It's for loving yourself. It's for you know, making an influence, affecting other people in the universe in a loving way. I mean, that's what I believe. Yeah, me too. <laughs> a billion percent. <laughs> Love, yeah. kindness. Yes, yes, yes. Um, how many times I would say yes to that. Yeah. Thank you for saying that too. Sure. <laughs> and then the many of experiences, that's another section in your book. You say, writing as spiritual practice is very liberating and satisfying. It is liberating because when you release your secrets, you become free and have more control over your life. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful advice. Another one suggestion. I mean, comment you made. You, You say so many interesting things and powerful things in the book. This idea of liberation, of freedom, that's part of the spiritual practice, which writing is, how amazing that is. And then with that in mind, I'd like to ask you an open question about freedom. What is your idea of freedom? My idea? Yeah, beside this spiritual practice of writing, of course. Yeah, I mean, freedom is, is very subjective. It depends on the person, right? I mean, obviously that are going through war or having a different perspective as someone that's in jail in a free country, right? I mean, and another person will have a different perspective that's, you know, not going through anything traumatic. They're just walking down the street. So they're not even having the perspective of freedom because they've, they've got it. They've got it. They're, you know, they're blessed. So I think it really is very subjective. It depends on 
on the person. I think the freedom to do what makes you happy to me is the most important aspects of freedom, not to be bound by other people's expectations. If we're talking about uh, life passions and life purposes, to be able to do what we want to bring us joy, that's freedom. Uh, another billion times bad <laughs> idea <laughs> to be ourselves. That's so true, Diane. Oh, my God. Yes. And you say, under the same passage, you say, when diagnosed with breast cancer in 2001, I journaled my way to recovery. I realized that there is no time like the present to seek bliss. And then goes back to the idea of being in the present moment and present to what is present, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's like what is, yeah, it's all about being living in the now. And it's it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, you know, we admire the Buddhists and their practice and we try to emulate, but it's really, really challenging most of the time. You know, we're trying to make ends meet. We're trying to keep our family happy. We're trying to get our kids educated. We're trying, you know, it's just, um, it's really great in theory. And it's really great when you're meditating, but in reality, it's in the world we're living in, it's very difficult to practice. It seems very simple, which is kind of being present to whatever is happening, like now talking to you, not trying to rush into the future and think about the next assignment, whatever I have next or you have next to do. That is a practice. You're right. It seems very simple. The, the body's here, so why not stay here with the mind? But it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I think technology has really affected us in a negative way in that sense. You have a rule in my house, no phones at the table, because there was a time when everybody was at the table. You know, when my kids were teenagers, that was uh, 20 years ago. But when they were teenagers, they would sit at the table and, you know, be texting and whatnot. And uh, it, it just felt as if nobody was present. They were with someone else. There was, there was an invisible person at the table with them who I couldn't converse with. And, you know, there was no dinner conversation. Still do that for Thanksgiving when we get together. Um, but it's um, and it's a discipline because people are tied to their phones. I mean, it's it's, a, it's one of those mixed blessings, the phones. You know? <laughs> uh, I often think about objects, the things that we have, uh, the technology and everything that we have that is so useful like having anything that, that has two sides, right? Like a knife could cut a fruit and feed the body, nurture the body, and could also kill somebody. Right. So it's how we use. It's all about the way we perceive the world, uh, what we are aware of. So it goes back to that personal responsibility. Right. Another section in your book is the patterns in our lives you say looking into and examining our past, the patterns in our lives, where we came from and where we are headed is one way to understand who we are. Yeah, I was reflecting about this because it's conditionings, right, Diana? We have so many of them. Yes. Ah, that's really a challenge to kind of break the patterns a lot of times. And, and sometimes we have to just kind of make peace with them and be aware of them instead of trying to get rid of those patterns. Right. Would you like to make a comment about breaking patterns and be aware of them? Well, again, you know, when people are having patterns that they think are having a not such a good, I don't like the words positive and negative, but not such a good impact on their lives. I mean, I always suggest journaling because all lots of things are illuminated when you get your thoughts on the page. And that's one way to break a pattern that's not working for you. So, so true. We are able to see clearly, right, what has been always happening, what we have been doing that is not leading us to the destination per se that we want to be. Although I don't believe in destinations, but I do believe in happiness. <laughs> so that could be a destination. <laughs> Why not? There is um, another section where you write, uh, you, I think the title is Writing About Difficult Times. Yeah, that's the, the passage. And you mentioned Siegel. I don't know who he is, but uh, 1989. Did he write a book about disease as a gift? He did, right, Diana? Yeah. 
Yeah, he did. He, yeah, he's he's a great. He's a he's a medical doctor who's actually you know began a big strip spiritual practice, and he blurb. I think he blurbed this book too. Yeah, it's interesting because I always say that my cancer for me, my first cancer, I'm mean, two time cancer, sorry, was a gift in the sense that it slowed me down. It made me realize what was important in life. And then you also, I mean, there's so many um, passages in your book, the wounded healers and storytellers. I love that too, that section where you talk about personality types. You said, I believe that type of narrative chooses you. That was kind of interesting to read that when writing, right, Diana, that we don't choose a narrative style. Uh, it chooses us. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I tell people when they're writing to write like they're talking or sitting across the table from their best friend telling their story. You know, that's, that's your most natural voice. There's a sense of trust too, right, Diana, because you're talking to a friend, so you're open. Right. Ah, that sounds really good to me. I love the, this advice. How do you meet new students? So how do they find you? What's the best way for them to connect with you? Well, the best way is to go through my website, which is um, Diana, D-I-A-N-A-R-A-A-B.com. And just click on, you know, the contact page and you can get my a message will come to me and I will respond. Uh, also, all the events that I'm giving are posted on my website. I've been doing, a, obviously, because of the pandemic, I'm still doing a lot of online teaching events. I teach on Daily Ohm. I teach two courses. One is uh, about memoir. One is about therapeutic writing. So you can find me there as well. Wonderful. I'll have those links on your podcast profile. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you so much. So great hearing your voice again. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your wisdom, everything that you do to make this world a more peaceful one, healthier, peaceful one. <laughs> well, I would just say we should all do our part for peace on earth. Mm, yes. Ah, oh, not a billion times to that. Yeah. To be <laughs> peace out there, we need to be peaceful here. Yes, That's I agree. <laughs> thank you so much again. Thank we'll you. talk soon. Thank Bye for you. now. Yeah. You too. Ah. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. To learn more about Diana Rabb and her work, please visit dianarabb.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.